In early 1943, citizens of Stratford, Connecticut, report sightings of strange saucer-shaped objects flying overhead. This flying saucer is America's first near-vertical takeoff aircraft and just might be the answer to the problem of providing ships at sea with fighter cover. Nicknamed the Flying Flapjack, it is the brainchild of a maverick genius, Charles H. Zimmerman. Charles Zimmerman uh, typified the kind of engineer that we saw in the United States emerging and working in the field after the 1920s. America discovered that she was very far behind the European countries in the development of high-performance fighter aircraft. Charles Zimmerman was one of the people who led the drive to make up that deficit. In 1933, Zimmerman joined the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor of today's NASA. The NACA was an extraordinary organization in that it rebuilt the technical excellence of American uh, technical work. Uh, the NACA created, for example, uh, a far better understanding of how one should design wings. At NACA, Zimmerman's objective is to find the perfect wing shape. As a result, he will design an aircraft that is still way ahead of its time. He is fascinated by the notion of developing an airplane that has a tremendous speed range, that on one hand would have a very high-end top speed, on the other hand would have a very low-end landing speed. An ordinary aircraft wing has a wingspan from root to tip in order to create lift. This is called a high aspect ratio wing. The way an aircraft wing works is by creating different areas of pressure. What this means is that we have the wing here, and as the airflow hits the leading edge, it has further to travel from there to there as it does from there to there. This creates low pressure here and high pressure here. And as the air tries to get from the high pressure area to the low pressure area, it pushes the wing up. But an ordinary aircraft wing has a great drawback. The wide high aspect ratio wing creates a drag effect against the airflow, which slows the aircraft down. But Charles Zimmerman has an answer to this problem. The idea was, why don't I have a much smaller wing, a much lower aspect ratio wing? A narrow wing creates less drag, allowing for faster speed. But it too is problematic. When the spill happens over the side of those short, stubby wings, as happens on all wings, the, as the air moves from the low to the high pressure, it causes turbulence on the edge of the wing and therefore reduces lift and increases drag. Now, the effect that has overall on the wing is greater on short, stubby wings as opposed to long wings. To force its way through this turbulence, the aircraft burns more fuel but Charles Zimmerman is the first man to discover a solution to this concern. Zimmerman's solution to the problem is breathtakingly simple. To stop the air from spilling out under the wingtips, he decided to move the engines to the wingtips so that the spinning blades of the propellers push the air back under the wing. With the turbulence problem solved, the narrow wing allows for less drag and greater speed. But the new design has another revolutionary property, vertical takeoff. What he's looking at is something in many ways that's akin to what we would consider the tilt rotor today. His idea basically is to develop what we would call a super stole, a super short takeoff and landing airplane. Zimmerman discovers that the unique characteristics of the low aspect ratio wing, combined with the wingtip propellers, means the aircraft literally floats off the ground vertically in a stiff breeze. In 1939, as war clouds gather over Europe and the Pacific, the U.S. Navy orders a prototype fighter based on Zimmerman's revolutionary concept. It is called the V-173. It has a wingspan of only 23 feet minuscule by today's standards. To save time on the test design, a fixed undercarriage is used. The tall legs set the aircraft at the best angle to ensure immediate takeoff. The cockpit extends under the aircraft, providing a more extensive view, like a helicopter.
The V-173 flies for the first time on November 23, 1942, with Vought's chief test pilot, Boone T. Guyton, at the controls. On the very first flight, Boone Guyton had some real problems. The aircraft almost went out of control, but it, it flew so slowly, it got it back on the ground. There, they discovered that the problem wasn't in the design of the aircraft itself. It's simply that the controls had been wired up incorrectly. The V-173, uh, like many experimental airplanes, was an airplane that was not really suited for production itself. It demonstrated the basic concept that Zimmerman was trying to achieve, the fact that you could develop a controllable aircraft that had a reasonable range between low speed and high speed, that had all the attributes of a stall aircraft. After some adjustments, the flying flapjack soon performs as Zimmerman predicted. Facing into a 25 mile per hour wind, the V-173 literally takes off vertically. The V-173 was an aircraft that was a challenging machine to fly, but having accepted its uh, limitations, the pilots who flew it were really quite astounded by the high degree of control effectiveness they did have over this configuration. There were occasional accidents during the test flight program. On one occasion, the fuel line of the 173 was blocked, and it came down on Lordship Beach in Connecticut, much to the surprise of the local sunbathers. But the plane flew so slowly, almost like a helicopter, that it came down gently on the sands and was undamaged. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, the United States faces the difficult task of capturing island bases and building airstrips. A vertical takeoff fighter could solve these problems. The U.S. Navy orders a full-scale fighter version of the Flapjack. This new fighter aircraft is designated the XF-5U. With a takeoff and landing speed of just 40 miles per hour, it can reach a top speed of 500 miles per hour, phenomenal for any fighter of its day. The speed and agility of the XF-5U could match any jet fighter in service. The XF-5U is powered by two powerful Pratt & Whitney twin WASP engines. It is armed with six Browning machine guns and can hold two 1,000-pound bombs. But other engineers are also exploring the saucer-shaped wing. In Nazi Germany, work has begun in secret to develop a prototype aircraft nicknamed the Flying Beer Tray. The Germans were intrigued by the low aspect ratio wing but they never actually made the breakthrough that Zimmerman had towards putting the engines on the side of the wings. The prototype fighter version of the Flapjack is finally rolled out of the factory on June 25, 1945, but things are quickly changing in the world of aeronautics. We were undergoing a radical paradigm shift in aeronautics, and that paradigm shift was from the era of the propeller-driven, piston-powered airplane to the era of the turbojet. The imperative to develop jet engine technology at the end of World War II was very, very strong. Piston engine aircraft design and technology had just about reached the end of the road. In 1946, the XF-5U was finally unveiled to the public. But stories began appearing in the media, speculating that the unusually shaped plane is just to cover for a top secret flying saucer program. This does not endear Zimmerman's flying flapjack to the conservative military. By 1947, Zimmerman had solved all the problems and the aircraft was ready for its first flight. And suddenly, the United States Navy canceled the entire project and ordered the prototype to be scrapped. What is incomprehensible to me is after having gone to all this trouble and investing the sums of money necessary to bring this aircraft to fruition, the aircraft would be willfully destroyed before first flight because it would have been very, very valuable to the subsequent history of stall aircraft development and uh, subsequent uh, use and employment of stalled aircraft if we had the data from an aircraft such as the XF-5U-1 to place alongside the data 
from the V-173. Zimmerman's pursuit of a vertical takeoff fighter was not forgotten. But it was not until the 1970s that the US military finally acquired this type of aircraft, Britain's Harrier jump jet. Ultimately, Zimmerman's flapjack was sidelined by the United States' interest in a new technology, jet power.